All right. So there we go. Welcome back. Let me open up the chat so I can see your questions. That should work. Plus my user interface. So I'm still getting used to this kind of new platform, you know, YouTube Live. Never used it before. It should be fun though. Uh, so this should be fairly interactive. Um, I have some videos though, but we'll do mainly in product, product demos. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. I've got two screens here, one for me to navigate through Stingray and Live, and one that's showing me the, the chat. So if I'm not, you know, getting carried away too much, I'll hopefully see your questions uh, in between and I can react. All right, so let me sh start sharing my screen and move myself to the to the corner right there. So once again, welcome everyone to the Meet the Experts webinar series. This is a series that has been existing has been around for a while, I believe. We have kind of dropped them in between uh, and, and tried to roll them up again end of last year. So hopefully this is something we'll do more often for each and every one out there. My name is Alex. I'm a product specialist at Autodesk for Media and Entertainment. My kind of main turf is 3ds max but i'm also very excited about all sorts of real-time engines have been um, testing and, and working with real-time engines for about 17 years now um which is which is quite exciting and well and then today we're going to talk about the life design ecosystem predominantly about the stingray part in it but also we'll shed some light at the new autodesk life service so when we talk about that ecosystem we usually are talking about product wise about a product called life a product called revit 3ds max and stingray um so so that's kind of it but there are many many more products that can be part or of that of that kind of ecosystem when we ask Autodesk what is life design, there's a kind of a vague description because it's a very open idea. Uh, it's life design is the ability to fully understand a design digitally before anything is ever built in the real world. Now, isn't that exciting? It really is. Because today, with tools like the HEC Vive and... Uh, the Oculus Rift, uh, augmented reality coming in, mobile devices being more powerful than ever. Uh, all these kind of interactive tools that are available at our fingertips, um, they are really, really impressive. Not only to uh, as a decision-making tool, but also to, to tell a story, attach emotions to a project. Um, ultimately, to, to sell an idea and to make people understand your vision, right? So this is all... What, what life design is, is trying to uh, allow you to do, if that is even English. So um, we are going to look into this. And it looks somewhat like this. So when we talk about the Stingray workflow, we usually say Max or Maya as a kind of a, a funnel for whatever data you have. You can put all you have into 3ds max and then do a level sync update into stingray and use stingray as a real-time engine to to create interactivity right that's perfect um and in that case we i'm going to, to talk a little bit about revit into max into stingray but this could be anything if we if we look a little bit further or back down here you also see the live service i'm going to cover that in a moment like like later on uh, but there's also so much more you know all the the the, the potential deliverables uh, where you can output to desktop or to a mobile device or vr um, that's all part of that life and stingray uh, idea so this is a short scene that has been provided provided to me by my colleague bruno laundry this is a scene he set up i believe a few years back sorry for the jittering in this this video I thought it's a good idea to do one PowerPoint with the videos in and I could tap out, but apparently it's not the best idea. Um, anyhow, this is a scene that has been set up a few years back for V-Ray rendering and Pruno has been, well, 
giving that scene out to to us in order to to also test test run the ability to com automatically convert V-ray shaders into uh, Stingray shaders. I've recorded, hopefully this one plays back, uh, a very short, this is a one, like a one minute pitch about that workflow that we are going to see in in a minute. Uh, it's playing back okay -ish, hopefully. So you see through his max on the left hand side, Stingray on the right hand side, this level syncing tool we're going to see in more detail in a moment. Uh, this level syncing tool allows you to, to um, well, fast forward, basically pull, push every data, every geometry and material that you have in Max into Stingray. We now have a global elimination a light baking engine that we see um, happening right there. And after that, we can tweak our environment shaders, um, basically make it visually more appealing, if that makes sense. Um... Perfect. So people have been trying the live uh, product, but haven't added a lot of interactivity. And this is fantastic because for those of you who don't know, life is basically powered by the Stingray engine under the hood. So we can open up live projects in Stingray and add that sort of interactivity and even put it back into, into life afterwards. Right. So once again, that's just a very, very brief and like, 200 no 500 percent sped up video uh but we're gonna see how this really works and let's skip over this slide we don't really need that let's hop out of the powerpoint all right so that's that's always a little bit more fun um i've opened up 3ds max here hopefully my hat is not in the way so there's not nothing like magically happen behind my webcam right now so i'll just keep it online and oh that's perfect it's you bruno i i didn't even know okay fantastic so i've max here um uh, we have stingray open up there so i don't know how many people have tried stingray yet if you open up it up the first time it will offer you a number of templates also a more and more like a larger number of online examples that you can download for free uh, those are brilliant learning examples. For example, there's the, the learning museum itself explaining PBR materials, explaining how particle effects are uh, are being created in Stingray, etc. And you can take these these uh, templates, basically download them for free and use parts of these uh, shaders and or particle effects in your project. So here I've got um, an empty level right there. And that's, that's Stingray itself. It's an HTML5 driven modular user interface. Now, let's say I have this apartment inside of 3ds Max and I want to turn that over into, into Stingray. As you can see, there's again, no magic happening. It's not a whole, whole building. This is kind of the apartment you would potentially have inside of 3ds Max for pure visualization in, in mind, right? For, for rendering or doing some, some sort of animation. So let's go back in here. What we can do after installing Stingray, you have this pull down menu called Stingray. Let me zoom in. That works. It's magic. It's great. So we have the level send ability for 3ds Max and Stingray. Same, by the way, for Maya and Stingray. So if there are any Maya users here, you can do the exact same thing. And here I'm saying the whole level, just everything over into, into Stingray. And let's say send and close. Perfect. So if I open up Stingray on the lower right hand corner, hopefully you can see uh, it's now importing files. It's basically creating FBX files for every group um or every single object inside the scene and placing it as independent objects inside of stingray so it's basically rebuilding that whole 3ds max level that you had inside of stingray and you uh, this is this is really great because here we can now interact with those objects we can animate them we can uh, add interactivity because well it's a real-time engine so we can and uh, that's that's really great what's even better is that this kind of workflow fully supports instancing right so many of you who are using 3ds max they are used to have force pack um, rail clone some some sort of i2 software scattering algorithm right and you can turn those uh scattered 
objects back into instances inside of 3ds Max, and those instances will automatically be uh, or get picked up by Stingray as well. Or we can do it manually, you know, just use that, that chair over here, move this guy over there, maybe copy it multiple times. Let me see, did I do a copy or an instance? Let's do an instance. Um, maybe move, do that rotation a little bit, just some randomness to it, all right. Let's pull down another set of chairs to the other side of the table. Fantastic, very cool. And once again, I can just go on the Stingray. Basically, let's do it even, even, even better. Uh, Max and Stingray side by side right there. So now if I go on the Stingray, send level all, um, it's basically just sending the missing assets that are not already transferred. So I can just send and boom, it's there. So there's no real magic happening. It's a little bit of magic though, uh, because what, what actually happened is 3ds Max just told Stingray to take that one chair that's already got imported into Stingray and create those instances for us. So this is why it's instantaneously updating those new positions from 3ds Max over into Stingray, which is really, really powerful if you if you think about it. Also from a um, performance point of view, working with instances in a real-time engine is so much more, well, um, effective than having unique examples of those of those chairs in, in your in your in your scene what you can also do you can link up your camera to 3ds max so if i now move around in my scene on the on the left hand side inside of stingray well it's updating those camera movements on inside of 3ds max as well this goes as far as tweaking the the feel of view inside of 3ds max's camera just as an example and this will be updated inside of stingray Right, so it's a it's a very nice back and forth. Is there a way to send the whole scene the re reverse direction from Stingray to Max? For instance, if you're importing to Stingray from Live. All right, so there is uh, actually there is a file um, export selected. So what you can do, it's not like the, the the neatest way of doing so, but you can select all these objects inside of your scene and you can do file export selected and this will output the level as one huge FBX file. So if it's just about having the, the same positions from a geometry point of view inside of 3ds Max as you have in Life or Stingray, you can do that. I would prefer doing Revit to Max uh, in order to add some entourage into the scene, some some characters, etc., uh, and at the same time you can go from Revit into Life into Stingray and just add these kind of extra detailed sofas from from Max into Stingray, if that makes sense. Um, what what's what's definitely possible though, and you might be aware of that, all these files here they are stored inside of the Stingray uh, project folder as FBX files. So if you go there and do a right click, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, but this allows you to send single objects over into 3ds Max and Maya uh, whilst maintaining uh, their materials. So that's that's kind of nice. And by the way, uh, I don't know if you see this. So we got some kind of waving uh, curtains right here. They're not waving. They're even, not even animated inside of 3ds Max. Oh, okay. I. <laughs> they are. But there's no vertex. No, no, no flex modifier. Nothing weird or, or like a bend modifier happening right here. But what's really, uh, well, working under the hood is a shader effects, shader, a direct X shader inside of 3ds Max. And this shader has kind of a vertex animation on it, the same as you would use for uh, tree animation, for animating your vegetation. We can use that for animating these curtains very, very um, cost efficiently, is that? Is that correct? Mm. Also, you, you will see here that those uh, materials on the other objects, those were V-Ray materials and they were automatically converted into PVR. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So so they, they are doing big leaps in terms of improving Stingray and uh, as well as Life. Life and Stingray are running on the same uh, core since, I believe, November, if, if that's correct, Bruno. 
Yeah, absolutely. And 1.6 was a big release. And I, I can't believe, you know, I've been starting demoing Stingray almost one and a half years ago, and it has come so far in that short amount of time. And they are releasing new updates every two or three months and uh, really digging into that life design uh, process right, right here. Cool. So let's disable the live camera tracking. I have to keep track of time as well. So let's say I'm in Stingray now and I wanted to Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip skip one one little little tiny part going over the, the asset library, which is an external tool for 3ds Max. It's a free download where you can, you know, basically derive from uh, downloading or buying assets from creative market and those will automatically be stored in your asset library and then you can easily drag and drop your your products into your max software and get that pushed over into stingray with a single click as well so just be aware of that asset library is really great even if you don't use creative market just to manage and maintain your existing props it's a it's a fantastic tool to do so so let's do one more thing now uh, i really i want to to go with you through kind of the, you know, one, two, three, four, five tools that will make this scene look great. And one of these tools is the light baking engine. If you throw that, or if you bake that, start start baking this guy. Mm. Well, you know what? I haven't saved my level yet. Let me, let me start saving this guy. Mm. So this is my new level. If I start baking, it will actually use the uh, the GPU, yeah, to start calculating my global elimination and uh, solution. This is by using the SkyDome HDR or by using uh, well additional lights in your scene that can be also be sent from 3ds Max into Stingray. And if you go on the full render, you will actually have the ability to also look at this diffuse ambient pass that's being generated right now so it's it's calculating that global illumination engine uh, solution on the fly uh what ring making an interior scene with high poly objects from design connected will stingray know how to deal with a high poly for use in real time or do you need to downgrade the polys yourself well um Basically, you have to downgrade yourself. They are essential tools for doing so inside of 3ds Max, and they are very nice optimization tools inside of Stingray, like level of detail, dynamic level of, well, it's not dynamic, but like, like using level of detail that has been pre-calculated inside of 3ds Max, and depending on your uh, distance to, to the object, it will use the, the lower res or the higher res object. So there are certain tools that will help you or allow you to quite efficiently scale down a high poly scene to a real time uh, ready uh, environment. I'm not saying it's effortless. It's I'm not saying it's it can be done in, in, in minutes, but there are definitely good ways to do so. All right, so uh, let me see. Light map taxels. So this is this is nice. What we see here is the second UV pass that's getting automatically generating for generated for all your objects that you want to do light baking on. And this is fantastic because Stingray doesn't force you to do your second set of unwrapping inside of 3ds Max. You can just throw all these uh, objects into Stingray and start light baking right away. If you want to have a higher resolution on certain objects, you can just select those and say, I want to have a resolution multiplier on those, those books and see how this checker map got updated. So now we have more detail for lighting on, on those books, just as an example, right? So I'm going back down and put into my um, full rendering here and this is like super splotchy right now i would need to to just keep it running for another 20 30 minutes maybe um depending on my quality settings and my light baking solution so of course we don't have 30 minutes just just sit here and wait so i'm going to open up another version of this specific level that has the light baking included already and it's not yeah, again, this is like a step-by-step -step tutorial, if you will. So we are still we still have to do a little bit of work to do in order to make it really shine. So let me catch up with the um, 
with the chat. Is it possible to use Stingray directly using inventor files? Nope, it's not. So this is where 3 Max again comes into play. Uh, 3 Max has the auto translation framework, which natively, as you probably are aware, uh, can import uh, the IPT and IAM files from inventor. As soon as you are there, uh, the level syncing will automatically pick up those um, building groups that are now inside of 3 Max and, and import that into Stingray. Um, uh, Stingray currently, as its 3D geometry import, is FBX driven, FBX file driven. Um, Max has LOD utility for handling LEDs. Just, oh yeah, okay, that's Adrian. Okay, perfect. I've had problems with materials baked into Max going to Stingray. Yes, um, AJ, we can probably talk about this a little bit uh, uh, offline. So uh, I do have a scene converter script uh, inside of 3ds Max uh, that we've created in order to use, for example, shell materials that you've been creating inside of Max. So if you want to use V-Ray texture baking, you can do that inside of Max and still use those texture baked materials and convert them into a Stingray shader. So it's basically just a script. Uh, I can make that available to everyone uh, uh, as well as to you. And just so you're aware, inside of rendering, there's a scene converter tool, which is now new to 3ds Max 2017, if I can find it. There it is. And this is all Max script driven under the hood. So we've created that kind of material conversion and then you can easily bring that over into, um, into Stingray. I hope that makes sense. Cool. Nice. All right. So thanks for still being around. Uh, as I said, here in this specific scene, we do have the light baking done-ish. So, so there's still a little bit more uh, that we can do in order to tweak that specific scene once again. So uh, I'm going to search for an object that's basically part of every Stingray scene. It's the environment, shading environment. And in here you can, as an example, use a different Skydom map. See those clouds in the background? Maybe we want to change that. All you have to do is import um, a texture at first and then assign it to, to the background and you're, you're good to go. And now we can just, again, as an example, dive in on tweaking those reflections. So, and there are different ways of doing so. Uh, a very clever way is using so-called reflection probes because, well, this is real time, right? So when talking about real time for VR, for example, we want to output 90 frames per second. So uh, there are a lot of cheating, cheaty things happening in real time engines in order to still have very good visual look and feel, but be able to output these 90 frames per second. And one of those tricks is using reflection probes. What this basically does is um, saving a static texture of your environment. Whoop, if I can select that probe, let me do this. Did I? Oh, there we go, sorry. Uh, reflection probe settings. So if I zoom up here, this is the current radius of that single reflection probe. Uh, this is where it's trying to affect the environment by, again, baking down a cube texture, um, projecting that back down to uh, that reflection probe and then use that as a source for the re local reflections of these on these objects. So we can, as an example, we can go in here and um, lower those sizes a little bit. Don't know if that makes sense. Uh, just just like that. You can tweak it more and there's a very clever tutorial from uh, Paul Kind on YouTube uh, who goes through the creation process of reflection probes more technically, so more mathematically, right? So you have these reflection probes ideally lined up so there's a little bit of a fall off between them, uh, but they have their own little, um, you know, uh, environment they are taking care of. As soon as you have placed the, re re the reflection probes in your scene, you can go under window, window lighting, bake reflection probes. And let me, let me read up here, utilities panel. Yeah, is there a restriction on file size export from Max to Stingray? None that I know of. Absolutely not, right? So um, it is, I would say, best practice to split up 
a big scene into FBX files, and this is where that level syncing tool comes into play, because instead of having one two gigabyte FBX file, it will take uh, groups and hierarchies, and for each of these groups and hierarchies it will export one dedicated FBX file, making it a little bit more easily digestible by, by Stingray. But there is Stingray itself, it's a, it's a data-driven uh, engine, making it very, very mm, tweakable and, and, and uh, very fast when it comes down to huge polygon counts, right? Cool, so now we have the reflection probes in here and uh, let me see if that works. If I move one of these around, there you go. See how that reflection actually changes when moving these reflection probes around? So they are not meant to be moved around, that's, that's for sure. But this is just to show you that we now have a very cheap and easy way to do a little bit of reflection in our scene without... Um, dynamic reflection calculations. So this would be, for example, this would be a very clever way of outputting to um, to iPads, right, or mobile devices. Uh, we model in AutoCAD and the file link, filing that into Max, could this file linked CAD file be subsequently linked into Stingray? Uh, so there's no current like active file linking into Stingray right now. Mm, the level syncing tool will help you to some extent there might be, um, you know, there, there might be some restrictions, especially when you start deleting stuff inside of your Max or AutoCAD scene and, and how that's getting updated back into Stingray. But I will look into that and eventually Bruno has a, a sharper answer to that as well. Um, does Stingray handle the cat blocks as instances just as Max does? Mm, I don't know. Bruno, maybe, maybe he has tried. I haven't tried. So as long as it's in some sort of hierarchy or, or group, for sure it does. Uh, pros and cons of the cube size relative to the reflection probe. Mm. Okay, so so the cube size of the, the, the those, those those helpers, gizmo sizes we saw on the reflection probes. Uh, if you if you shrink that down a little bit, you will have more. Um, I would say localized. Uh, reflections. Uh, on the other hand, uh, especially for, for big scenes, big environments, you might as well go with the default settings for these reflection probes. Uh, they're kind of performance... Uh, um, they're they're, they're, they're uh, kind of cheap on the performance, very efficient, right? Uh, does this solution is adapted with Max scenes build it civil... Da, 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 da. Um, so if civil 3D objects, roads and crossroads are being maintained in Stingray, is that the question? Um, on a geometry level, yes, but you will lose kind of the logic behind it, if that makes sense. But we have civil 3D examples where we've outport, uh, exported uh, traffic simulations from Max into Stingray and it works like a charm. Uh, so... Uh, it's really good. All right, back to this environment stuff. I will read down through the questions in a second. Uh, for example, what we can do as well, we can activate screen space reflections and this will give us real-time reflections in our scene where that kind of partner up with the job that those... Um, that's fantastic. Uh, with, uh, with what the reflection probes do, all right? Nice, okay. Uh, back in the environment once again. Mm, bake diffuse, you can tweak this guy a little bit. The, tweak the reflection tint as well. So we can basically tweak our scene so it's really um, shows off uh, shows off to our liking, liking right? So that's, that's something we can do right here. There's screen space uh, ambient occlusion as well as reflection that we already saw. Uh, depth of field can be tweaked individually in real time as well. So I can tweak the, the region and the actual distance for my depth of field. And I can, for example, scale down the near intensity of my depth of field, right? Just making it a little bit more subtle. And what I also like to do is I really like to do uh, go into lens quality and give it a little bit of that 
chromatic aberration. Not that much, but like very subtle. So you can more feel it rather than see it, right? And of course we can add blooming, which some people love, some people don't like it. Uh, this is that kind of over bright shininess, splotches, uh, whatever. And I, I'll see if I can find a lens dirt map. Yeah, that's in my scene already. So if I crank that up as well, as soon as I look into those bright areas, you will see kind of a smudgy lens uh, in your in your scene. Like this is way too much, but that's the beauty of it. It can be tweaked interactively uh, in, in real time, right? All right, so let's go over back into 3ds Max for a second. And if I come in here, if I can find it, <laughs> There we go. See, we got an animation on a sliding door. So this is a custom sliding door. Uh, you'll probably see what's, what's really beautiful about the workflow from Revit into Life, that Life automatically acknowledges all, all defined doors or almost all of these doors inside of Revit. But if you have like a custom built door like this, that's not necessarily part of Revit family, mm with a with a defined open close animation uh, or whatnot you still can handle that inside of 3ds max like predefine that animation and bring it over into into stingray so let's open up or select that those sliding doors and export those via another tool called the game exporter and what this allows you to do is basically export a selection or set of uh, objects into animation clips so I can have an, um, an opening animation for 100 frames, as well as, for example, a closing animation of these sliding doors. And those will be marked and delivered in one FBX file or multiple FBX files and, and uh, outputted into Stingray. So now I have my uh, close animation and my opening animation. I can preview those inside of 3ds Max. All right, let me, let me see. Mm. Now that should work. All right, cool. Um, so as I said before, we can output back in that into, into Stingray. Let's find a folder where we want to output it into. As you can see down here, we got our asset browser. Mm. Oh, let me see, let me see. Uh, I have to open up my, my streaming once again. There we go. Okay. So I have uh, the asset browser down here inside of Stingray. And if you do a right click, you can show your current project folder inside of the Windows Explorer. And basically it's a pure reference. Your, your Stingray project folder is a pure representation of a Windows file folder structure. So now I can copy that file folder structure, go into 3ds Max and uh, define that I want to output that FBX file right here, name it doors. And I want to bake down the animation, export successfully. There it is, my FBX file. I can just drag and drop that into my Stingray project once again. I have to do that because even though the FBX file is inside of the project folder, we haven't defined what kind of data needs to be pulled out of that FBX file. So in that case, I want also to import the animation clips as an example. So there we go. We got our door and we got our closing animation and opening animation. Nice. And we can drag and drop that over into our scene just like that. So now thinking about adding interactivity because that's what a lot of people want to do, right? Tweaking the scene so it looks beautiful is one thing, but then you want to do some, uh, tell, tell some sort of a story. And part of that story could be, well, to be able to open and close that door, right? So in a lot of game engines, you usually have to start scripting or programming. Not so much in Stingray, you can do that. Uh, but what Stingray allows you to do is having a graphical representation inside of a note editor in order to add interactivity. So with my doors selected, I can here now, now do a right click and create kind of a node that represents my doors. There, again, if that makes sense. And then you can do a tap and search for additional nodes. For example, I know that there's some sort of a play node in here. And this one allows me to play an animation clip. Mm. 
Oh, what about integration of point clouds from Recrap 360? Very good question. No native point cloud support yet. Uh, although Recap 360 Pro has a pretty fantastic meshing alg algorithm, so you can turn your point clouds back into geometry and use that inside of uh, Stingray. I have several examples and projects where I've done this. I've even used Mudbox in the process in order to generate normal maps from the high-res geometry and bake that down into a low-res uh, geometry, if that makes sense. So there are a lot of uh, things that we can actually do in order to trick away around in order to uh, to visualize uh, a laser scan mo scanned model inside of uh, Stingray. Mm. Okay, perfect. All right, so what I have here is my play animation clip and I want to uh, make the animation not loopable. And I'm doing two animation clips because one's opening, one's closing, right? That makes sense. And let's say I want to have my doors opening at first and then want to have them closing. And this should affect my level unit, which are my doors. That's as simple as it gets. Now we have to define the trigger. This could be push of a button. This could be uh, pointing with my VR device on those doors and, and, and hit, I don't know, the, the, the thumb key or um, <laughs> hit the trigger. What we could also do, though, is create kind of an area trigger that is part of 3 um, it's part of Stingray as a solver or, or a gizmo. And all we have to do is define that trigger to be a character trigger. So it kind of reacts to my player, to my camera, as soon as I walk through this yellow box. And now I can create, uh, again, the graphical or the note representation of that trigger. And as soon as that's being touched, as soon as I'm inside the trigger, it should open the doors. As soon as it's outside of those triggers, it should close them. Now, finally, before we start play and just test what we have created, I have to do one more thing. And that one more thing is opening up specific parts of my model and to find that those should be collidable. Is that an English word? So what I mean is we want to define that we cannot walk through walls and we uh, are not allowed to fall th uh, through the floor, that kind of thing, right? So now I have the floor selected here, and all I need to do is create a physics actor for that for that guy, which automatically by default is a static physics actor, and that's it. So we go out of this, hit play, which allows us to test play that specific level with whatever control we have defined. So we could hook up our iPad and start play testing through that level, or we could hook up uh, our VR displays, etc. So here we go. I can now start walking around in my scene, which is uh, nice. And as soon as I approach that door, at some point, hopefully, those doors are gonna open up. And as soon as I move away, they're closing down again, all right? So it can be easy as that, and you can do more and more um, clever logics with that kind of level flow um, tool that we that we just saw. All right, quick time check. We we are relatively good at time. Um, let's show you two or three more things. So what I have here is a ceiling fan. It's not necessarily made for this kind of a you know <laughs> super nice apartment here. But still, I'm gonna gonna place that in my scene because what I what I want to show you is another way of playing an animation without going having to go through flow. So this FBX file has another animation clip, as you can see there, it's playing. But uh, all I have to do now is um, well, I have to tell Stingray that this animation should always be um, played or triggered uh, by default. So what I can do, no matter if that's a, a 3D character or a sofa or that kind of ceiling floor, ceiling fan, fan excuse me, you can create an animation controller for, for that object. And as soon as that's done, you can open this guy up and simply drag and drop the animation clip that you want to loop in that animation controller. And that's important because it allows you to do all sorts of clever things, right? This allows you to do uh, f three different speeds of that of that fan, for example. So we have a playback rate that we can change from clip to clip and to blend between those. Uh, all of this is possible. So as soon as I save that down, 
that fan starts animating itself, rotating. There's another fan with a, with a different animation controller or character controller that I can track and drop in my scene. And you will probably see that this guy is rotating slower because I have to find a different playback rate for, for that one over there. So, pretty straightforward, comparably, I would, I would say. So let's get back into that PowerPoint just for, for a second. Mm. How do moving objects affect lighting? Mm. Well, they do. Um, what, what you can do is, if, if, if I've baked down my light solution, right, and then, then I'm, I'm moving around that sofa, um, changes, ch chances are that there's gonna stay a black splotchy shadow on that empty space where, where the sofa just was like in, like a second ago. If you have dynamic objects in your scene, you want to exclude them from texture baking and instead use just the dynamic lights on those on those dynamic objects, right? And Stingray is able to to kind of blend between your your dynamic solution and your pre-baked solution. This is very clever, especially if you have um, Maybe you have interior light, but you still want to be that is baked down, but you still want to be able to dynamically move around the sunlight. That's something uh, the, the life editor or life player does. It's allowing you to adjust the sunlight as you go along. So this is the light information that's not baked down. And um, but the but the uh, ambient occlusion can be baked down or the uh, indirect illumination from photometric lights, for example, or, or lights, artificial lights, I should say. I hope that answers. Um, cool. Let's go again in that PowerPoint just for a second. Mm. Revit FBX exports don't contain any animation information. Is there a way to prepare Revit families to simplify the creation of these animations inside of 3ds Max? That's a very good question. I'm not a Revit pro. To, to be honest, uh, hopefully life is going to be something that you'll be very interested in seeing in about 10 minutes uh, because life picks up these kind of Revit families and, and gets doors opening, closing automatically done for you, right? Um, yeah, exactly. There currently not yet is IES support. Uh, Etc. There are ways around that. So we have light projectors where you can, if, you, if it's more like a visual thing that you want to just just do, you can, as soon as you have an, an IES texture, you can use that as a light projector inside of your scene inside of Stingray. All right. So there are workarounds to, to, to get the look and feel. All right. So mm, VR. Virtual reality, uh, no matter if you're using Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, Stingray supports both in a fabulous fashion, I would say. They are Steam VR and Oculus Rift templates. Most importantly, if you open up Stingray, there are online examples and there's a very nice Vive VR Museum template that is being, I would say, updated every now and then with more and more examples. So I'm, I'm, I wasn't able to connect up my, excuse me, to connect up my wife for today. We are planning on having another webinar in the Munich VR uh, lab that we have down there. And hopefully we'll be able to show you uh, some, some proper VR workflow with a collaboration of screen sharing and, uh, you know, camera recording. But for now, this is not connected to my to my uh, to my computer, but th for those who haven't seen it, it's basically two of those controllers. Uh, then we have two lighthouses that allow you to specify where you are in space, and you put on these goggles, and you have a full blown three D left eye right eye experience, which allows you to fully interact with your scene by using these controllers. And this is exactly what the Vive VR Museum allows you to study, to, to go into. So this is, if I close this guy down, it's not playing nicely, is it? It's playing okay, okay. 
So, so for some reason, it seems to play okay on the stream, but not on my screen right there. Mm. Fantastic. This is just a once-minute intro. On that VR uh, sample that we have. And I mean, look at that. There they are countless ways of doing HTC Vive implementations inside of Stingray. But the beauty is that for none of those, you have to actually get into programming. All of this is done via the flow nodes that we saw in order to open and close those doors. Yeah, about the performance, absolutely. Is there a status that shows how much performance your scene is using? Absolutely, yeah, Bruno, I'm gonna show. Uh, uh, well, Richard, very good question, and Bruno, you're right, I'm gonna show the performance head. Mm, let's do this now, I assume. <laughs> so if you go on the view, there's a performance head for all sorts of different um, things. Uh, most importantly and most complex one is the artist performance and this allows you to study what's happening inside of your scene. What's beautiful about this is that the performance hut can run live in your editor but it can also be run on your iPad on your mobile device because this is usually where, where stuff breaks, right? So you, it looks beautifully on your GTX 1080 graphic board and then you export it over into onto a mobile device and it stutters and it's slow and you don't know why. And because these statistics can be ran on those mobile devices, it gives you a very good idea of what's, what's actually happening. And performance hard artist performance is one thing, but there's also stuff like culling performance, right? So, so we want to, to cull stuff that's behind a wall, for example, so we can optimize that inside of Stingray and get statistics uh, out of that as well. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, wireless battery back for the HTC Vive. Absolutely, that would be uh, fantastic to arrive. For now, I believe MSI has a backpack, like a laptop that you can um, uh, put on your back like a rucksack, and uh, this allows you to kind of openly walk around in the HTC Vive area, which is nice. All right, so uh, let's open up that, just just briefly, let's open up that VR museum if I can find the right one. I believe this is it. Uh, there we go. So I just wanted to show you this VR museum uh, because it's great as a learning experience, number one but also as a source for pulling the logic that's inside of that scene and reutilize that within your own project. And I just want to show you where to find stuff and where to pull it from and where to put it into, if that, if that makes sense. And maybe I'm gonna open a text editor on top of that. Nice. Loading my level. So I'm not sure. So you have seen the, the video whilst that is loading. Not sure why it's loading that long. Mm. Let, me, let me show you just, just this quick video. And this is just uh, a recording of the HTC Vive. Um, for those who have never, have never used it, there is the concept of teleportation with HTC Vive. So you can basically point uh, somewhere and teleport there. People have been spending lots of time, like tons and tons of time, um, to, to counter motion sickness that is very easily introduced by these kind of VR um, devices. And teleportation seems to be one of the uh, tr ways to travel that, that are working quite okay, you know, uh, because you see where you're going and then kind of the... Uh, you, you, you get it right so so that's all right so once again this is the stuff you can do we saw these uh musical elements there what i like is also the flashlight example here turning off the lights and just having a flashlight and then experiencing your scene by that uh so that's fun also next to that is the bubble maker which if you think about it looks funny 
but this could very well be a fire extinguisher and be used in a, in a training environment, you know, for fire departments, etc. So uh, even though those are kind of toy experiences or prototypes, it's absolutely universal. Um, you know, you can just go into these objects, take the logic out of that and put it on your own geometry. All right, stuff like light switches. Um, oh, there's a no gravity mode, like space. Is that is that good? I like it. <laughs> uh, physical doors, uh, steam valves, all sorts of stuff. That's that's basically part of that VR um, template. So let's see if that opened up inside of Stingray, and it did. Nice. So here I can move around. And again, I just wanted to show you where some of that logic is is um, living. So if you, for example, just want to throw around a teapot, there are several, several things that are happening under the hood. Basically, if you open up that template, you open it up, uh, you open up those objects that you want to animate inside of the unit editor. And here we can do, this is where we define the, the physics actor, right? So here we set the physics actor to be dynamic, so we can do stuff with it. Uh, but there's also the unit flow. And this looks a little bit intimidating at first, but there are several groups in here that do uh, well, different things. So for example, highlighting the unit, if you go over it with... Um, with this, right, with the remote control, uh, it's it's gonna have that kind of outline and giving you a tactile feedback. So it's like a short vibration. If you it's just just telling you this is something you can pick up or it's something you can interact with. Uh, also, pick up a sound file if you uh, play back a sound file if you pick something up. <laughs> Looked like a nightmare, yeah, absolutely. And the, and my point here is, you don't have to create any of that because it's already there. So what you can do, you can basically copy or select all of that, copy that in your clipboard. And if you have a notepad open up, you can control V. And this is placing that in an XML representation, uh, just pure text, right? So, because what we see here is kind of universal. There are a lot of units that are just referring to me so I could copy that kind of logic uh, into into a new project or uh, into onto a new object. The only hooks that need to be adjusted are the ones that are named like the teapot. So this would be from teapot to fire extinguisher, um, right? So and, and this is potentially also part of this guy. So because now we have text, we can do a search and replace, replace all teapots into fire extinguisher, and then. Again, select everything. Let me let me let me try to do that. Even uh, replace teapot into fire extinguisher. Replace all. Copy that into my clipboard once again. And now let's say I have my fire extinguisher. There's no logic in there. Nothing. I have my 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 code in the clipboard, and now I'm doing a Control V in order to rebuild that kind of. Uh, you know, note layout, if we zoom in, it's now changed from teapot into fire extinguisher. And now I can move that guy around, etc. Right? So it's it's basically, as I said, it looks a little bit scary, um, but it's really not. Because all you need to do is be aware of these hooks that define which object it should manipulate. And just copy and paste it in there pretty 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 cool <laughs> especially in conjunction with the uh, you know with that template here so thinking about that color swapper here um, what I've done uh, no what uh, a colleague of us has done we've we went back to that New York apartment made some tweaks to that change it a little bit you know some some additional environments like like you know better entry space uh, etc I believe the kitchen scene has been uh, updated, the bathroom has been updated, etc. But most importantly, they took that color swapper, that's a, that kind of color swatch thing, and put it onto the kitchen table, which 
is a nice example of how you can take a logic that's part of that template and put it in your in your project. Um, once again, wasn't able to connect my HTC Vive today, but I've recorded myself and let me see if I can get rid of my webcam for a second. So here we see me starting moving in the apartment. So I'm just doing a quick time check. So we're running for another, I would say, 10 minutes, if that's okay for you. Uh, once again, this webinar is being recorded. I'm going to put it up online next week. Uh, but I still want to show you the live part. And then I have some examples. So so if that's that's okay for you guys before the weekend, we, we will just hang around for, for a little bit. Uh, again, that's the color swapper part. You just pick one of these colors. point at one of these objects that you have defined to be, uh, you know, changeable, like the walls or the flooring, and, and that's it. Nice. All right. Uh, so a brief summary of Stingray, and there's so much more. Mm. In fact, I haven't showed you any of the, of the sound systems that are in here, uh, but overall you can quite easily create a complex interactivity, go through different scenarios inside of your object and uh, inside of your scene and visualize those. You can output to mobile devices, desktop, as well as VR. Uh, you have the live link to 3ds Max, obviously, uh, whilst 3ds Max main, you know, is being maintained as one of the big tools inside of Max, uh, inside of Autodesk, that can import a whole bunch of different file formats, including Revit, obviously. And then Stingray allows you to do all sorts of things, right? Authoring for your your stories, your animations, add additional contents, um, do the global illumination, light baking. All of that can be done inside of Stingray. So what if you're not that tech savvy? Let's say you want to just quickly create an interactive visualization without spending too much time um, into, into it yet, right? This is where Autos Live comes into play. Uh, and it's defined to be an on-demand interactivity or create uh, on-demand interactivity for architecture, engineering, engineering and construction industries. And basically, uh, I mean, the concept is like that. If I go up into my Revit model here, it's going to install itself as an add-in, giving you that go live button. As soon as you're in a 3D view inside of Revit, you can click that go live button. Uh, this is a cloud service. At, at, as soon as you hit go, it's being uploaded to the, to the Amazon clouds and optimized for real-time visualization. You then get a download back. Let me see if I have a video on, on that. Ba -ba -ba. Um, there we go. <laughs> don't know, we don't need sound for this guy. So here we're uploading everything by hitting the go button. I'm not doing that while, while streaming, if, um, if that's okay. Uh, it's pretty fast. Uh, so usually you get a scene that's that big in a matter of minutes. And you can open up inside of the live editor, which allows you to pre or redefine your your Revit views. Let's let's do that live. It's a little bit more fun. Um, uh, so I have the level uh, the, the 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 live viewer installed. So let's open up this guy. So there are two components. And you know what? I can probably pull back, put back my my, my webcam online. There are two components, or three components. It's the, the cloud optimization service, and then you got the live editor, and you have a live viewer. And the viewer is absolutely free, so everyone, all your clients can install it for free and just open up these live files and start moving around in, in the scene that you have just prepared for them with basically a single click. And this, again, this is what it looks like. This is an untouched uh, live scene prepared automatically on the cloud for you in a matter of minutes. All those RPC trees, those cardboard trees are 
automatically replaced by 3D trees that even have that kind of vertex shader that we've used on the curtains um, on them. You have a georeferenced sun system in here. It still has the, the artificial lights that were positioned inside of Revit in here as well. It supports all the Revit views that were set up in Revit. And what's really cool is you have a BIM information picker. So you can click on objects on that door and you get all the BIM data that was part of, of the, the Revit fam families based on where you click on, right? So 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 that's, that's all in here. Mm, let me move up into the den. What I really like about life, apart from all what we've seen, is that it automatically opens, closes these these doors for us, right? Remember how we animated the sliding door? Nothing of that has to be done manually inside of Life as long as Life recognizes the, the sort of Revit family that has been used for those doors. Um, and then finally, there's navigation in here because Stingray is a full-blown game engine. We have sort of pathfinding in here as well inside of Stingray and uh, Life uses this. So if I click on that uh, in the courtyard, it will automatically try to, well, get the fastest way of, of, of getting there instead of flying, but just walking there. So markup in Life, I'm not... Sure, okay, it's in progress. Is that for, no, that's Birgit. You mean markup, like like drawing annotations inside of, uh, inside of life, doing this needs to go away and do this and that. I'm not aware of that functionality. It would be interesting to have though. Hmm. Nice, all right. So now, okay, perfect, no markup yet. Um, <laughs> What's what's really magical, and I, I I so much like this this whole idea of of the life design ecosystem when it comes down to this. We've seen how easy it is to get from Revit into Life, but now that we know that Life is kind of Stingray, and with what we've seen, what Stingray can do, wouldn't it be great if we would be able to to open up that Life scene inside of Stingray? Well, we can, right? So you can open up a Life projects with a little bit of a you know, walk around, so, so, but it's, it's getting easier. You can open that up inside of Stingray and do stuff like add animations, add a little bit of uh, light baking in here, maybe tweak your, your, your shaders. Um, and you will still have building information model uh, data in here. You still have your point and click go to functionality all of that still works because stinger can then be compiled back into that kind of live project so you can still output um the the, the the live file and give that to your to your client or you stay inside of uh stingray and you know have it having uh create create an exe file out of that so if i can move your eye to the lower right hand corner there is a little vr button and this is Brilliant again, because with a single click, as soon as you have the VR headset connected, you can have that very same scene inside of the HTC Vive and move around in here. So this again shows a little bit of that workflow, one click, da da da. Uh, and as soon as you connect your VR device and you click that VR button, you're now able to move around like, like this. And it's also displaying, like for, for people, if you have an audience, one has the VR headset on, uh, it's it's going to roll out that one eye, one one of the two eyes on the screen, on the, on the big monitor, for example. So one has the VR experience, but others are kind of able to share the point of view by having the same experience on, on a 2D screen at the same time. All right. So that's very briefly life it's a little bit unfair because it's so easy that we can show it inside in, in, in like five minutes but uh, just remember it's one click 
service that allows you to make your Revit designs interactive and maintain the BIM data. It's fully compatible to Stingray and it allows you to tweak your Revit views and your style of rendering inside of the editor and then output that, package it up for your client on iPad Pro, on um, the desktop or with the functionality of, of driving it via a VR headset. Cool. All right, let's take another like five minutes and then I'll let you go into the weekend. Uh, live design examples. And these are just a few projects that we've done over the last couple of months, I, I would say. Some of them I was more <laughs> involved, some of them less. So this is um, a project the America's team has done with a, with a uh, stadium. This stadium uh, or this, this whole workflow is nice because we've been using Stingray to visualize CFD wind flow data that has been calculated inside of Simulation CFD, another solution uh, provided by Autodesk. So the whole video shows a Google SketchUp import of that Kingdom Memorial Stadium. And then we are using InfraWorks to gather a little bit of surroundings for that stadium because it's a real stadium. It's, it's, it, it, is, it is somewhere. So we can get the, the exact um, location, put that into InfraWorks 360 and use it in order to generate an FBX mod model based on the on the data that's available on the internet, put that into 3ds Max once again. And you know where we are getting with this, right? We were preparing everything inside of 3ds Max, no matter where the data comes from, we put it into 3ds Max. And as soon as that's available inside of Max, we can push it back into, into Stingray. So here we see, you see Autodesk CFD doing that kind of wind tunnel analysis, that kind of math really uh, can be outputted as a CSV file. So it's a big data table structure that is available inside of 3ds Max 2017. So you can import CFD data in here and we can visualize it by, for example, creating kind of cylindrical splines. And then because 3ds Max allows us to also create these kind of stingray shaders, Excuse me for, for that kind of scary view. Uh, all that showed was the standard Stingray shader plus an animated texture. And that animated texture are these little, little arrows that you see. Those are following the UV, UV direction of those splines that have been generated based on the CSV file. And because this CSV file has tons of additional data like temperature, pressure, uh, speed, we can define or we can colorize those, those, those arrows based on that additional information. And we're doing that by activating another trigger inside of the, of the Stingray shader. So now those arrows are colorized based on the speed that they're traveling in. And finally, we just output that into, into Stingray and have predefined CFD data right at your fingertips. You can, you know, push one, two, three, four, five and get through different solutions. Nice. All right. So that's one project. Another one I really liked is kind of a product visualization. So, well, this is, this is something where we talk about extending the ecosystem, but at this point, I believe you get the idea that 3 Max is capable of creating a whole lot of different data, right? So here we have inventor data being imported into 3ds Max, and 3ds Max also now supports driving animations uh, whoop, coming uh, from, from Inventor. And this then has been outputted into Stingray. And Stingray has, besides sound systems, behind, uh, besides uh, path finding, uh, it also has that kind of user interface system that we call scale form. So you can define and set up your own uh, user interface system and uh, use that in order to drive your visualization. Cool, I hope that makes sense. Nice. And then finally, this little project here, 
uh, Louis Macou, one of our colleagues, he has created a procedural roller coaster tool that is driven by Max Creation Craft, a procedural framework uh, inside of 3ds Max. And all it does is it's creating those um, tracks for the roller coaster as well as pillars. Um, the, the beams for, for the roller coaster and the ladder, everything is procedural. So we can still move around our splines that are defining where the roller coaster tracks should be and how they should be oriented. And because we have that kind of sent back and forth between Stinger and Max, we can easily make changes via that MCG roller coaster tool inside of 3ds Max and just with a single click get the, these new positions updated and sent over into, into Stingray. So if I show you this guy there we go we got the roller coaster inside of stingray positioning it at uh zero 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 and the tool inside of max does one more magic thing and this is animating a camera so we can simulate basically a roller coaster ride inside of 3ds max and instead of rendering it over and over again we're using a real-time engine namely stingray to go through different variations of that of that roller coaster uh, yeah, and this was kind of a fun way to do oh, kind of an Oculus implementation, but just a pretty warning. I mean, at this, at, at just a short warning at this point, everyone knows, hopefully, roller coasters and VR don't bundle nicely. Especially, well, if there, there are some roller coaster projects where you're actually having a goggle uh, on your hat and you're going with the roller coaster but in here if you're in an office chair like i am it's kind of a guarantee for motion sickness so you don't want to do that uh sora asks if i go back to inventor do you think in the next release stingray will be ready directly to, to directly uh, read i uh, i a m files i doubt it because everything currently in stingray is built around fbx so sorry for that. I know though that in the within the idea of life design, you know, nothing is impossible and the, the ultimate mantra will be to to have kind of the same service as Revit inside of other tools as well. But when this is going to happen, I don't know and I can't really tell. Uh, the other question was, is there any tutorial on how to do this like in the KitchenAid video? Um, doing a product configurator. I I honestly, I don't think we have this on the learning channel. So in, inside of the stream, I've linked up the, the uh, learning channel in the description of my, of my YouTube channel, but I don't think we have the product configurator. I'm going to share my um, email address in the end, like in, in, a, in a second, and you can drop me an email and I will see if we can f at least give you some sort of uh, logics from that flow note for for creating that that product configurator if that makes sense just to get you started right all right and then finally and i don't believe we need sound for this so i'm going to deactivate this so this is uh being created in stingray once again in cooperation with g healthcare life sciences and this starts same kind of the same way as we saw in the template with a big overview of that building and then we can teleport into that building oh that's perfect bruno yeah that's nice if you're able to help out with that so as soon as we're in that building we can now deep dive on you know on those machines i've deactivated audio but there is voice telling us what is happening right there and because we have a wise uh, audio authoring system included inside of stingray you can basically do all sorts of sound authoring event based so it does not have to be a pre-recorded audio that goes all the way through but it can be triggered at certain stages throughout your uh, experience all right Let's hop out of this, and I believe <gasps> that's it. Almost, almost there. So I could do a little bit of a bonus for those who still want to hang around, but in order to stay in time officially, I just wanted to open it up once again for questions. I was trying uh, with the support of Bruno, thank you, uh, to 
to read through some of the questions in between. So hopefully we've done a good job on that. If you have questions in the long run, please feel free to stay in touch on Facebook, Twitter, um, I guess most directly via email. If you want to test out the live design, you know, ecosystem with Revit or Live or Max or Stingray, please feel free to download that stuff. It should be in the description of this um, um, pa -pa -pa -pa, of this stream right there. I've also linked up the Autodesk Games How-Tos. This is the traditional YouTube channel by Autodesk doing a lot of, you know, Stingray tutorials and recently very much for the life design industry, which is really nice. And I've also linked the personal YouTube channel of Paul Kind, who's uh, kind of a Stingray evangelist and doing a lot of additional tutorials on, on Stingray, which is really cool. So, uh, yeah, if we get to uh, the link for rewatching the seminar, absolutely. Let me post that for you guys. Mm. Because what we are going to do is we are going to link it up on the Meet the Experts website, which is this guy, this one. And there it is. Yeah. So hopefully that, that works, that link for you. Currently, absolutely, it's not on, online, but it will be in by the end of the next week, I would say. Are collisions auto-calculated for geometry? Um, they can be. Well, absolutely. You just have to define which objects you want to collide with, and then you can uh, create concave or convex um, collisions based on either proxy meshes or like a capsule or a box, or you can create the, the collision objects based on the mesh itself, mm, which can be kind of heavy if you have a high polygon object in your scene and you just say absolute accurate uh, collisions for this guy. So it would be nicer to do a pro optimizer inside of 3ds Max on a high poly object and then just export that along, hide that low poly object and just use it as a collision, right? Mm, perfect. All right, just, just reading up some on some questions. Hopefully I haven't missed any. That looks kind of all right. Uh, I really hope you like that kind of format. This was the very first time for me doing it on, on YouTube Live. I personally like that we're able to, to do that kind of interactivity with the chat and but also with what we are showing, right? So we are we are able to dive through those real-time scenes. If you have feedback on that, please let me know. If you want to drop me a message, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, just just again, let me let me know. That's very helpful for for the future all right so i guess i'll keep it at that worked smooth perfect nice okay i'm i'm really glad you you liked it and again uh thanks to jose elizardo prono and paul kind for providing me with a lot of this content especially the new york apartment uh, jose has put a lot of work in this kind of, um, you know, uh, workflow, which is really useful for for us over here because they are US based. It's good to have something here in Europe as well. All right. Hey, David, good to good to read you. Nice. Hey, Matty. Very cool. Once again, thanks so much for joining. I guess I can... Hmm. You know, for those who still hang around, I'll just open up one more, uh, once again, that, that Aquarius scene, because that's that's kind of fun to show. Um, it's the WI system, the audio system. It's, it's just... Wow, you can do so much with it. It's really amazing. So let's say you have that kind of uh, thing here. Let me let me see if I can open up another level, a later one. Mm, this guy. So we have that boombox, that that radio down here. And let's say I wanted to. Well, it's not even there. <laughs> oh, perfect. Let me let me do the following. Um, going into Max. 
here, we got the asset library, which I didn't show, um, but you can use that to quickly track and drop stuff into your scene, just like this. Um, for example, position it a little bit nicer with the object and place tool, put it up here. Then I want to connect up to Stingray, send my uh, current selection. Send. There we go. Oh, this is because it's a different level. It's a little bit uh, offset it to, to, to the wrong direction, but that should work. And now we can go on our audio. Hopefully this is not too loud for you guys. Let me see. Play. It should do some weird house club music. And you can use these sounds to either do a 2D sound that's being played the same way everywhere, or you can position them as 3D sounds by simply drag and dropping them into your scene. Um, oh yeah, and there are questions about how to package it up, uh, and I totally didn't show that. Um, sorry for that. Uh, so we got... Ooh, it has it moved? Where is it? Where is it? Deploy and connect down here. Uh, deployer. So here, see, you can package it up for Windows, which is basically a bundle as an AXI file. You can uh, do your own Android, iOS packaging. Potentially also PS4 and Xbox uh, Xbox One uh, with the SDKs attached to it, but but that's that. And apart, apart from the deploying, you can also connect it via TCP IP. Basically everything instead of Stingray is TCP IP driven. Uh, oh yeah, WebGL, absolutely. I have it, I don't have it activated in here, but we have experimental WebGL uh, to support, which is cool. Um, future proof, I would say. But here you can just, you know, say I want to, for example, have my Android mobile device connect up to my editor via TCP IP, right? And you can do that. And, and, and then again, if you combine that up with the performance hut as, as an example, it's a great way of prototyping your scene all the way through. So back to that sound file right here. If I open up WYs, which I've been talking about, which is our, not our, but the fully licensed audio uh, middleware that's part of Stingray. You can go in here, here's our audio file. If I play that, there we go. Oh, oh pause, stop. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm putting these two side by side. So what I can do is I can go in a position, in, into positioning and if I can find it, Oh, that's, that's wrong. Where is it? Let me, let me move that over here. And let me move this guy there. There it is. So this is our kind of curve as to, uh, you know, at which distance, for example, the output volume should lower, lower itself. Now, if I go into Stingray and hit play, I will have that audio file playing directly, but as soon as that's there, you can hear it, right? So as soon as we move, sound is changing. Hmm. I can move down here or move back up there. Now what's cool is because everything is TCP IP driven, even that viewer that we have there is currently, I move that here and that guy over there. This is currently uh, available through my TCP IP, through my IP address plus port. So I can remote access that in WYS, connect it up. And now if I add another key from here, cranking up the music a little bit. So we can still move around in our scene whilst in real time tweaking our audio effect. And this is true for many of the aspects, editor aspects inside of Stingray, which uh, support uh, like hot, hot loading or you can tweak your own navigation paths, etc. So this was the final bonus. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And I hope 
who enjoyed it. Have a wonderful weekend. Let me switch my view. Thanks, everyone.